Hi guys, I'm GKCS. We are talking about a problem called Chain Reaction from Hacker Earth. Okay, in case you haven't played Chain Reaction, you can have a look at the description below. Uh, what I'm going to be discussing is my approach to solve this problem from Battle of the Bots 7. Battle of the Bots. It was a very, very interesting contest. And in fact, Hacker Earth hosts these contests uh, once in every two months usually. So they have a really good platform for playing these games, except for some uh, issues, but we'll talk about that as we go on. So there have been some requests to actually talk about the strategy that I used in Chain Reaction, and we'll be talking about that right now. So the first thing I did here was to use the Minimax algorithm. Okay, looking at this problem, I saw that the branching factor is going to be seven or eight at the very most. Okay, the number of rows that we had in the in the chain reaction thingy, you know, the board. In fact, the number of columns is the thing that matters. So the number of columns was seven, and the number of rows that we had were eight. So no, in fact, I think it was five by six or five cross five. Yeah, something like that. So even for five cross five, this is a pretty complicated board. And what happens is. Of course, if you are playing chain reaction, uh, you get to place orbs on this board, right? And your opponent also gets to place them. So if your opponent has enough orbs, let's say the number of adjacent squares, if it's four, and you place the fourth orb here, then they explode. And all these orbs go to the nearby squares and convert them. So this single orb becomes a green orb, and plus the one that flew over here. So there are two now, okay? Now this is a very basic way to explain what's going on here. If there are two orbs here, two blue orbs, then uh, that can't exist because the moment you place the second orb, it should explode because there are just two adjacent squares. So they'll explode, one will come here, one will come here, and this will become empty. Okay, that's how the game goes. And the game ends when either, no, there's just one condition where the game ends, yeah. When the entire board, has no green orbs or no blue orbs. Okay, so two player game, one of them is using blue orbs, one of them is placing them. You can place them only in empty squares or you can place them where you already have an orb. Okay, and uh, the game ends when you have no empty squares uh, and all the orbs are either yours or your opponents. So whoever has the orbs of their color at the end wins. Okay, so simple enough game. Except that the number of combinations possible from every position are huge. And finding a good heuristic for this is very, very, very difficult. Uh, I say this because no one, none of the contestants was able to come up with a sensible heuristic. And I say that with a guarantee because my heuristic was completely ridiculous. It, it just used to count the number of orbs that I have. Okay, the number of positions which are mine, let's say blue. And it used to subtract that to the number of positions that my opponent had. So this is ridiculously simple. But this, you know, uh, was the best heuristic over there. Or rather, this was the best bot over there for a very long time. And in fact, it should have been the best bot too. And I'll, I'll get to that later. So this is, now Minimax, of course, has a problem that it's not very scalable. Like if you go to a depth of four or three, so 25 is the branching factor here. 25 square is what will happen when you go to a depth of 2. 25 cube is what will happen when you go to a depth of 3. And so on and so forth. So uh, what will happen is at a depth of 4, you'll probably run out of space or time. Because you need to answer in, in one second. All right. And a typical processor does about 10 is to power 8 computations in one second. Which in turn means that you have just 10 raised to power 8 computations to do, yeah. So that, that means that you have 25 raised to the power 4 at most states that you can look into, okay? So the minimax is not going to work, the plain minimax. Uh, even if you use good heuristics, it's, it's too low a depth. 4 is too low a depth to actually look into. So what I used was alpha beta after that, alpha beta pruning, and that typically gives you a 25% saving. So this became, let's say, if I was searching these many states, 25% saving per branch. That means 
25 raised to the power 4 into 25% saving that is 0.75 per branch so that becomes 25 raised to the power 3 and now I'm searching only these many states so that's a big saving now of course I'm not going to be searching only these many states I'm still going to be searching as many states as I can what's effectively going to happen is that the depth is going to increase so I'll be probably searching at a depth of 5 so you see at minimax plane minimax is giving me 4 uh, the alpha beta 1 alpha beta is giving me a depth of 5 this is what happened actually in the contest and my program was performing okay it was quite good it was it was coming in the top I think 20 programs so alpha beta was quite useful but one thing that I kept thinking about is if I could judiciously use all the time that I have okay uh, which is basically in some positions the game gets very very complicated so that's where you have a branching factor of 25 that's that's the place where you want to think about 25 as a branching factor the other places the game is very simple so the number of possible moves are very narrow maybe just two maybe just one in these cases what you want to do is you don't want to go to a particular depth and then cut off what you really want to do is you, you want to go to as much depth as possible as long as you have the time to do it okay very important in the contest is the one second factor they don't care about how many states you visit they care about how much time you take and therefore it depends on the branching factor uh, as to how much depth that you can go to okay so simply put the next thing I did was iterative deepening here's what iterative deepening does in fact uh, for everything over here for minimax for alpha beta and for iterative deepening uh, I have made videos on this channel and I'll just post the links in the description uh, you can have a look at that but what iterative deepening basically does is it goes to the level that you can and if it sees that there's enough uh, you know if you, if you are able to go to a depth of level 4 then the next time you go to a depth of level 5 and the next time you go to a depth of level 6 and so on and so forth now this might seem like a waste why didn't you directly go to a depth of level 6 if you could uh, the thing is at depth of level 5 you can guarantee that you have an answer so when you go to a depth of level 6 even if you time out at least you have this answer at, at level 5 and you can return that that's the general idea you go to you basically have cutoffs that at least up to level 4 now even if 5 fails that's fine so that's the general idea and notice of course that at level 5 you're about 25 times you know more likely to fail because uh, at level 5 you need 25 you need to uh, evaluate 25 times the states than at level 4 so so on and so forth at level 6 at level 7 so on so this is the main idea you know iterative deepening and introducing timeouts so whenever my code went beyond 900 milliseconds I would throw a timeout exception and I would propagate that up to the main function uh, so of course the code is also in the description below so you can have a good look at that but uh, the timeout exception what it does is it says that I have no more time and the entire game tree fails so you come up you see that what is the last step that I searched up to and if that is whatever the depth is D you return the best answer from there okay this is a pretty neat trick and this is the biggest clearest uh, you know winning factor in a way this is the reason why the program went from rank 20 to rank 1 that's what happened when I did that it shot up to rank 1 and I was stunned I couldn't believe it there were people like Martin Wyman who had been winning for the past 3 months or something like they had been performing extremely well and there were other contestants also who have been performing very well and this program started beating their bots primarily because you know the heuristic over here was so simple and people were trying really complicated things uh, to get to nowhere you know <laughs> or I don't know if they were trying really complicated things but uh, the thing is the kind of competition power that I had was not being used by everyone else 
right? Uh, because this is a very simple competition, probably, probably. So iterative deepening really, really boosted the performance of the program. And I could judiciously use all the time that I had, the 1000 milliseconds, to, uh, to use some processing. Okay, so of course at this point I went insane and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna win this contest. And I started really trying every optimization that I could. Uh, they went, you know, no, no one was sleeping in the contest. People were going on submitting solutions and checking. And when the program, my program went to the top of the, uh, the leaderboard, uh, the people, the number of people who were testing the program against my bot was incredible. It was a, it was a real experience. It was fun. But what really happened after this is, uh, first of all, I tried to remove all the bugs in the program because there were quite a few. And uh, alpha beta usually, you know, ends up giving you some bugs. But apart from that, what I did was, I, but I'll just draw that. Like, yeah. So I saw the board is taking a lot of space. So every state was taking some space. So the board over here was 25 cells. That's quite a bit of space for every board that you're creating. And this is your game tree, it's a root. If you're going to about even 20 states from here, and each one is going to 20 states, you're creating a lot of boards Right? And that's going to be taking a lot of space and a lot of time to create. What I did then is to... The first process, of course, which came to my head was to use the undo function. And <laughs> there's a video on this too if you want to have a look at it. But uh, the undo function, basically what it does is it uses a singleton pattern. Uh, it, it creates a single object of the board and you play a move on it to get here. Okay, and once you're done all your processing, once you're back here, what you want to do is you want to go back here because that's a DFS strategy. You want to go back here, all you need to do is undo a move. So you pass the undo, you pass the move to the undo function and whenever you want to play a move, you pass the move to the play function. And the board changes its state depending on what you're doing. Okay, so undo is basically the inverse of play. Right. The inverse of play is this. <laughs> so this is the undo function. So I thought of doing this, but in chain reaction, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to actually implement this. Because you see that in chain reaction, if you place an orb, it explodes. And how do you undo that? How do you take orbs from nearby guys and put them back here? Okay, and then remove one of them. So, and even if you're taking orbs from the nearby people, uh, how do you know that they didn't change color? What if your opponent I'll just draw that to make things simpler. You know, you had an orb here, and let's say you had three orbs here. So you place an orb here, it exploded, it went in all four directions. And one of these guys, the one down, had two green orbs, which turned to blue because your orb came here. So it's getting too complicated to undo this function because it's become blue now. Right. Three also. And all these guys are gone. To new places. So the undo function is out of my head. I didn't apply this. What I did instead was to use something close to the singleton pattern. You see that these cells are all stagnant in a way. Like there are only 25 possibilities that you can have for each cell. I'm sorry, there are only 25 cells that you can have. And each cell can have only four possibilities, meaning that they have either one orb or two orb or three orb or four orbs of two different players, either mine or the opponents. So if you multiply all this, you get 25 into four into two, which is 200 possibilities for any given state, for any given cell, just 200 possibilities. No, not for every given. In fact, for all cells. So there are 200 possibilities of the board which can occur. Yeah, 25 cells, four is the maximum count, like the zero, one, two, three, four, and two players. So 200 possibilities of a board. What I did was create all 200 boards at the very start. Because 
you see that even if I go to a depth of level 2, 25 square, that is greater than 200. 625 is greater than 200. So why not create these boards at the start and use them? If a state needs board number 198, I give that to them. And so basically I have a board storage area mechanism, okay? Right, now that we are talking about creating less boards, what I also did was create those boards efficiently. I started using some hash function and all that, but uh, the results were bad. So the hash function trying to compare boards quickly and all that, that didn't work out very well. So I ejected all the code that I had from hashing and all that. Okay, so hashing did not work and the undo did not work. What really worked was create all boards. Of course, this is specific to uh, this problem chain reaction. It's not specific to, you know, it's not, it's not a general approach that you can take. Maybe some places hashing is really useful. Hmm. Now what? Well, there's just one thing to talk about now, which is the killer heuristic. And again, there's a, there's a video on that. So I'm really passionate about AI. You can check this video out also, it's in the description. Basically what this does is, it sees that if there's a really, really strong move that your opponent has or you have, you should play it first. Okay, for, for example, in tic-tac-toe, so this is the, you see that in the video itself. If x, x exists like this and you have zero and zero over here, what you really need to do is block this x. So the program looks at it like this way. Oh, what if I put a zero here? Then, well, you can put an X here and you lose the game immediately. But this will be noted as a killer move. This thing right here. So the other possibility that you have is to put an O here. Okay, but now you won't be checking what if X puts a move here. You'll directly check for this move. And again, you'll see a loss. So therefore, you'll cut off the search. You won't be searching further. You won't be searching for an X here or an X here or something like that. Okay, it's a killer move. The killer move is taken first. Uh, it's explained in more detail in the video, in more detail in the video itself. But what did it do? It improved the performance uh, a lot. So uh, there was a point when from rank one, the bot actually went to rank three. And I was a little disappointed thinking that, oh, this is bound to happen, you know. There are too many good players. There's no chance that I can reach rank one. But it went to rank three and that's when I applied the killer view mistake and it went back to rank one. So I think it's a really useful technique that we can use. There are, of course, other techniques you can use. Uh, Quasin search, you can use null search, but killer heuristic was what worked out and the only thing I had time to use there. What else? At this point, of course, I was feeling really nice. So I started checking at what point does my program actually time out. So if I give it 900 milliseconds, it's safely, very safely within the time limit. But here's a problem that I've seen in Hacker Earth, uh, especially with Java. I mean, I, I don't know about the other languages, but the promise time is 2000 milliseconds. But in this contest, I was able to only stretch it to 1150 or 1200. I'm not sure which, but that's much less than 2000. So that was the only amount of time that I could stretch it to. I could use 1200 milliseconds to give out answers. Okay. Uh, and yeah. Well, basically, I got some more time to process and then output moves just by changing the time limit. What I have noticed recently in Hacker Earth contests is that this has fallen down to 700 milliseconds for Java. And that's pretty bad. Hopefully, it will be fixed soon. But let's see. 700 is a little too low. It's actually less than how much uh, C++ programmers get. So, I would like that to be fixed soon. Yeah, apart from this, uh, at the very end, so right now, this program with, with 1200 milliseconds is able to beat every other uh, contest solution. Okay, with 1200, I think there were two people who were still doing very well. One was Martin Wyman. Okay, he's a very experienced programmer for AI uh, on Hacker Earth, so he's done really well. And the other guy was, uh, I think, Rodomir. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure about the solution, but uh, his spelling rather. So uh, these two programmers are quite experienced uh, 
in Hacker Earth AI contests and they were doing very well. So my solution was, you know, winning, losing between them. So what ended up happening is I, I thought of boosting this, but it was too risky. What if I get too many timeouts? Uh, at this point, I made a really, really bad decision and that was to change the heuristic. Okay, a heuristic is very important if you are using, you know, one of these techniques, which is alpha, beta, or something like that. The heuristic is the core of the algorithm. And what I did was I just saw the heuristic and I thought that, no, it's too simple. You know, uh, comparing the number of cells that I have to my opponents is too simple a heuristic. Maybe these guys are using much more complicated ones and getting success, that's why. But I changed it and this was maybe 15 minutes before the final submission and the heuristic sucked. It was terrible. And I know why it was because I was using integer division. So number of cells that I have divided by total number of cells. Now this is integer division. This is going to give you zero. So the heuristic is not making any sense. In fact, because there are division operations and I was using quite a few uh, comparisons and divisions, this was making it more expensive and making it more useless. So <sighs> the bot became shitty. I mean, uh, I'm sorry for the profanity, but the bot was terrible. Bad. And the rank went down. The rank went to somewhere around five or six. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, it was it was pretty bad. So what I did was I changed the heuristic a little more. Uh, it improved a bit, but there was still this problem, which I don't know how I can catch in teacher division. Like wow. Uh, finally, I realized that this is a mistake. Right. Better go to go back to the original solution but it was a little too late. Like there were, uh, I think 30 seconds remaining when I decided this, I picked up my code from Git, copy pasted that onto the Hacker Earth uh, submission site and I pressed submit. But at that point, what's happening is everyone is submitting the solutions. So there was too much of a queue and the submit didn't get recorded. It could have been anything. It could have been a front end issue. It could have been a database issue. I I'm not sure, but it didn't get recorded. And so the best solution didn't go through. And finally, the rank that I got was rank three, which is very satisfactory for me, but I didn't expect this. So I was terribly disappointed when this didn't happen. But rank three is a very, very uh, good rank for me. And I was very happy to actually participate in this contest. And for me, the highlight of this contest was uh, when Martin Wyman, uh, he's someone who, I mean, I really like his solutions. So I was practicing. I had written the algorithm and I submitted that. So I was testing it against Martin's program. And I saw that you know, his program was able to look deeper. So maybe 10 moves deep. And it was able to say that it's losing. While mine didn't know that it is winning. So after two moves, mine was looking at a depth of around eight. So at move, you know, uh, two moves later, my program started saying, yeah. I'm winning and Martin's was very clear by that time that I'm losing. So that is really nice. I mean, a program which is not able to see that far, but purely by using uh, instincts or, you know, heuristics, although I don't know which one it was, uh, it's able to play better than the other person who's able to see further. So that was, that was the highlight for me. And that was a really, really good moment. I mean, I was, I was uh, really charged up after that. And I, I started using all these optimizations after that. So yeah, that's it. That's a summary of everything that I did in the six or seven days of the Hackerath contest. And uh, if you have any, you know, if you have any comments on this, or if you have any doubts on what I spoke on, uh, you can leave them below, of course. And you know, I'll be uh, doing a video like this on the coding game contest also. Uh, so if you want a notification for that, you can subscribe. Uh, until next time, see you.